listen to the family. Justin Robert Young. I put the jury in jury Saturday. Um, somebody suggested on Twitter that we should just call this show Jury Day. Um, that since it really doesn't have a day and I move it all kinds of different days, that it should just be Jury Day. And I like that. So I think Jury Day is going to be what it is. Um, I also think that uh, it, it's about time that we started releasing this as a podcast. If even just this. Uh, you know, I always kind of had grand plans of it being something more and having an interview uh, component, and maybe maybe that happens. Maybe that happens, but it is high time that this became a podcast. People want to ask him for it as a podcast, so it's going to be a podcast. I'm going to put it up as a podcast. It'll be fun. Um, so, with that being said, welcome, welcome, welcome to the program. I promised on Twitter I'd talk about a couple things, uh, and they are as follows. Um, all right. Why I haven't written a Walking Dead recap in two weeks. Uh, some quick election follow because I think people are kind of done with the election. But I, I do feel like it, it's, it's a good thing to talk about. And something that I'm going to get to right now that annoys me very, 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 very much about Twitter. And this happens every once in a while, but it happened yesterday, specifically yesterday. Uh, if you guys didn't catch on, on Twitter, um, there was... A uh, big news that Hostess, the Hostess company, was ceasing operation and that therefore brands like uh, the, the Twinkie, the Ho-Ho, the Ding Dong, the Snowball, they would, all, um, they would all be hanging in the balance. They would all have, uh, you know, we didn't, they're going to bankruptcy, Hostess was, so they were selling all the brands to the highest bidder, yada, yada, yada. And everybody on Twitter, because it is a tailor-made story, um, you know, in, in, in the news, they would call it a cupcake story. And not just because it was literally dealing with cupcakes, but because it's a fun, light, sweet story that everybody recognizes. Everybody has a stake in it. Everybody's been around these brands. They have a reaction to it. So people on Twitter start freaking out. and They're making gifts. But what people on the Internet do, they react creatively and they react with a disproportionate emotion because it's not a final record of everybody's beliefs on Twitter. It's reactionary. It would be like when you stub your toe, it's like, Hey, uh, I hurt my toe feels like it's going to fall off. And it is the most painful thing ever. Is that going to be what you think in a, in a week, in five minutes from now? No, but for in, in this particular moment, that's what it is. And Twitter gives you an opportunity to express that, to have that go out there and to have a community of your friends who might give a shit, pay attention to it. Now, around the world, uh, there were other things that were happening, uh, up to and including that uh, there has been a flare up in uh, the Middle East, specifically Israel, and uh, now after a, uh, Israel, the IDF, uh, bombed a member of Hamas, a senior member of Hamas. Uh, now, um, in the parlance of the Diamond Club, shit's going down in clay class. Uh, there's missiles being fired back and forth. Uh, today, the big news was that uh, the Iron Dome, which is like a missile trajectory defense system, so basically someone's trying to launch a missile into Israel, Israel launches a missile. It's like missile defense, basically, like the video game. They use that. Um, so I saw somebody on Twitter yesterday do something that fucking infuriates me. Okay? And it went a little something like this. All my timeline is talking about the hostess bankruptcy, 
while meanwhile people are uh, crying in Palestine and Israel because there's dead people. And they said it in a much more haughty manner, in a much more finger-wagging manner. In a much more, you should all feel bad because you've fucking written any uh, text about hostess. Because what you should be writing about is how terrible it is in Israel and Palestine. Now, now, it is not that I do not believe that this is a horrible situation. It is not that I believe that they do not have the right to express their opinion. They certainly do. But I have the right to say that that opinion is fucking retarded, for which it is. And this is how I would qualify it being that fucking retarded. Not everything is what you want it to be. And if somebody cares about this situation and also wants to express a silly joke about fucking hostesses and yodels, then they should be allowed to. Everything that you put on Twitter is not everything you think. It is some stuff that you want to react to, and people treat Twitter differently. It's not a diary for everybody. Some people just a place to read jokes. They don't even write jokes. Somebody doesn't even write. They're not even expressing something funny. So you know, it, it just it 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 blows my mind. And, 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 and to be honest, it reflects something horrifying in the person who says it. You should think less of the person who says that. And here's why. Because there's no way that it stops there. That it's just a Twitter thing for them. They are people that are frustrated that the world does not conform to the way they believe it to be. And therefore, they're frustrated that it's not a, a uniform proposition. That they do not get to define their own reality. Which, by the way, none of us do. <laughs> Tensor Guy says, all the medieval stuff happens uh, all the time. Sad but true. It's not every day that the hostess goes out of business. Well, uh, yes and no. I mean, you could say that what the, this specific kind of violence in Israel is fairly, uh, you know, it has happened before, but it has not happened at this level, uh, you know, in, in several years. And you could also say... That, by the way, for anybody who's like, oh my god, this Israel-Hamas uh, thing, that's pretty crazy. That in Syria, there has just been absolute murder. Because by there we go. Here, here's, what, here's, here's what you say to that person. Well, why are you caring about this? This thing that just happened today? And you haven't cared about how many other fucking genocides have happened on the planet? And are happening currently. Including in Syria. Where people are just getting murdered by the bucket loads. It's just there's there's a never you're never going to find the saddest story. And if somebody pins this as the saddest story and therefore the hostess thing is less bad and you should feel uh, uh, an appropriate amount of sadness correspondent to the, the space between these two points, then you should point to the point that's way below this. And just like, oh, yeah, by the way, how about decades of nothing but unending murder and female circumcision? How about that? How about you? You feel sad about that? I am. I'm. They're just sadness tagging. It's like they have a a, a, a paintball gun of sadness, and they're not comfortable with it. So they're shooting you with it. You're being shot, ladies and gentlemen, listening to this via live stream. You are being assaulted by sadness, and you should not have to deal with it. It's bullshit. You should be able to make fucking hostess jokes on Twitter without feeling fucking bad. And all you, everybody else who says that they shouldn't can fuck off and die. All right. <laughs> Jason Simmons says, and by the way, you can still get your little baby Swiss cake rolls uh, if you need a ho-ho fix. Well, that's fine. Uh, all right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, um, let's move right along. Uh, we'll, we'll do a real quick, real quick, real quick. Because we talk so much about the election. This is the first live stream I've done since the election. And since I made uh, the uh, hilarious decision to fill up my ballot online, which uh, I will say in retrospect, I immediately regretted um, and, and uh, was not 
particularly thrilled uh, as I went forward with it uh, or as the days got longer toward the election. Um, I will say this. I got some really cool feedback because of it. And I'm very, very happy uh, that I did um, get feedback from from people. Um, and, you know, I'll say this as things wound up working out. It was better that the way the election went happened or that it happened the way that it went uh, for me, because I would say that the majority of the people that watched me then and, and uh, you know, are watching me now did not agree with, let's say, theoretically, my choice for president. And should I had been right, or at least the nation would have agreed with me as opposed to disagreeing with me, I believe that uh, it probably would have caused more of a, a, a rift between uh, me and people than, than otherwise. Um, but the reason why I didn't, I didn't get a chance to talk about the larger point on why I wanted to do it um, when, when we did it, because my family came in. But the reason why I did it was to basically say that we can have these differences that even in the 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 slings and arrows of, of 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 a campaign we can disagree with things and specifically you know like i i i do believe that not everybody wanted to vote for for Mitt Romney was the worst person on the planet cuz i didn't think i was the worst person on the planet now you could uh, certainly say that i'm wrong and many 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 did and obviously the country thought i was wrong because they voted the other way um, but it doesn't have, you know, like I, I love the mudslinging. I love, um, I love, you know, the, the, the fun, you know, light character assassination elements of things. Uh, but you know, it is just an election. It is just name calling for the sake of name calling. Um, so there we go. Uh, I, I, I hope, I hope that there was some element that in, in the, the raging din of the, uh, of, of, of the election, that there was some element, some shred of humanity. If you enjoy listening to me, if you enjoy watching NSFW, if you enjoy watching weird things, um, you know, and, and for some reason you cotton to the cut of my jib that you could, that you could reconcile that, like, I might disagree with you politically. Cause I think that's important. I do. All right. Um, many of you pointed out there in, um, in, in, in the chat room that I, uh, am now paying out yet more stake bets because I did. I made two stake bets in a in a NSFW. A, I don't know if it was a pre-show or an after-show, with uh, C. Robert Cargill, uh, the man who is now going to be writing the Deus Ex uh, adaptation. Deus Ex coming to the big screen, and uh, boom, Cargill writing it, which is awesome. But I owe yes, I owe the writer of uh, Deus Ex and uh, and sinister a stake so i uh yeah i gotta send it to him i don't know whether or not i want to wait until because i would like to actually have dinner with cargill at some point I, I, that could be a fun way for me to get a dinner out of cargill is by paying for it so um i, I don't know whether or not i want to wait uh you know until i'm in austin at some point and i try to run into him or just get him a a steak brian i'll, I'll just have to buy an alcohol steak um and by the way i'm a steak factory you guys can go ahead and just rename me. I'm no longer Justin Robert Young. I'm Steak Factory Young, because that's all I fucking do. It's just produce steaks and send them across the country. This is my fucking lot in life now. I can't win a goddamn steak bet to save my life. And I only have one more coming up, and I'm out of the game. I'm out of the fucking game from here on out, okay? Okay? I'm done. Monado. It's over. I'm no longer betting fucking steaks, because I have one more left. And I feel strong about this one. I feel strong uh, about this last one, which is I took the under 
It is Legend of the Guardians. The uh, the the animated film. The over under is a hundred and fifty million. Rise of the Guardians. Sorry, Rise of the Guardians. Uh, so yeah, that's that's what the 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 bet is. It's with John Tilton, with blue cheese John Tilton. Um, I took the under on a hundred and fifty million. Uh, and I feel good about it for the following reasons. Here are the reasons. Yes, it is BCT versus SFY. <laughs> for the, the right staff stake. Uh, and it's $150 million domestic. Uh, and, and here's why. Here's why. Number one, I don't think it looks good. Number two, I have a fundamental... But me not thinking it looks good doesn't matter. Here's what matters. I have a strong feeling that kitty action movies do not do well. That if your movie is basically an action movie geared toward kids, which the trailer for Rise of the Guardians seemed like it was, and it is not comedy-centric, it's heroes rising up to the challenge, I don't think that they will do as well. I also think that be like, oh, it's the only holiday film, but is it? I mean, it's got the the you know, it's got Santa Claus who's tattooed, which is also goes into it. I I feel like the the tattooed Santa Claus is not something that either kids cotton to or parents want to take their kids to go see. And like it's got like Jack Frost is a main character, the the, the fucking sleeping lady, Sand Woman. The Easter Bunny, so it's not like it's not a it's not a, a, a Santa Claus does some shit movie. Santa Claus is in it. It's like an Avengers with with holiday people and you know the sleep lady, Sandman. Um, and I think you know people would be like, oh, well, it's the only kids movie. It's the only kids movie. No, fucking Wreck It Ralph still in theaters. And that shit's going to do gangbusters. I think it's going to outclass Rise of the Guardians. So we'll see. We will see. But that's my last steak bet. This is it. So either I go out on top with a steak to my name, or or I, I'm just, I'm, I officially am just Steak Factory Young. I'm just cutting, I'm just carving out cuts for people. Bzzz, bzzz. Like a butcher. <sighs> uh, real quick, uh, Jerry24, Jerry, what do you think of Donald Trump's Twitter meltdown after Obama won? I mean, I, I, Donald Trump. He's Donald Trump. If you want to watch uh, a great look at vintage Trump, uh, there's a 30 for 30 documentary that I believe is still on Netflix called Small Potatoes. What happened to the USFL? And it is it is Trump at his Trumpiest. It is awesome. It is amazing. Um, all right. What else did we want to talk about today? Um, okay. On Weird Things, one of the things that has been the most red stuff that I've talked about uh, or I've written on weird things, has been Walking Dead recaps. I started writing them in the second season because I very, very, very much enjoyed the first season of Walking Dead. I, I thought it was very good. And I I really, really, really wanted to document it. Things did not go well in the second season. And I very com- much contemplated not writing anything for the third season. Started writing... Uh, the recast for the third season, which at the beginning I very, very, very much liked. And part of what I really liked about it was that we had yet to see two great elements for which I had great faith in. The Woodbury stuff and and the Governor stuff. And I would add 2.5 being the return of Michael Brooker, Merle Dixon, which is a character that I very, very, very much uh, enjoyed. (sighs) 
And I really haven't liked... I mean, I liked the episode before this one. I thought it was well done. I very, very, very much liked it. But there's a creeping issue that I have with this season. And that is, I think the governor's boring. I think the Woodbury story is is stupid. And I really don't... I, I, I'm, I'm having increasingly less faith that the elements that I wanted to see explored. And mind you this, this is not me saying, but in the comics, because I hate the, but in the comics argument. I fucking despise that argument. So I'm not saying that it's not adhering to what happened in the books. I'm rather saying that there are elements of these stories for which I was very excited to see played out in the visual medium. And the governor should be the most interesting character. He should be. Because theoretically, he's doing the impossible. He's bringing fire from Mount Olympus. He is Prometheus. He is, is, is reestablishing civilization in a world without it. Now, he also hope, I mean, has these peccadilloes, has these elements of his personality that, that are very, very troubling. And therefore, like many systems, the larger system takes on the personality of the person in charge of it. And so Woodbury's a fucked up community because the governor who's running it is a fucked up person. That is the beautiful element of this story to me. Um, and really, what have we seen? We haven't really seen a lot about Woodbury that it's anything other than just kind of a cozy apocalypse town. You know, we haven't seen a lot of the sacrifices people make, if any. We just kind of know that it's a place. People are safe there. And what do we know about the governor, man? Like... Besides, yes, he has the creepy head wall, fine, but that's a set piece. That's not plot. Why he has that is plot. We haven't really gotten much into that. We know that he killed those people with, with the military. By the way, this is getting into spoilers, so if you don't want spoilers, then pause me and eventually just turn it back on, and or people will say in the chat room that we're done spoiling. Um... I, we, we go and kill all those people, the military people, the governor does. And then, like, but why? We don't know. None of his people that are behind him, they all give the sense that they do this all the time. Is it just because they like murdering? Because that's weird, and that's stupid, and that's boring. If they just like murdering, if you're just going to tell me that the governor is running this place, but also he has this thing where he likes killing people, that's it, it's the least interesting possible way to go about it. And I've said this, uh, I said this in the initial recap to that episode. The three ways that you can handle this, or three of the ways you can handle this, that, that popped first to my mind were either A, it's a math game. He only has as much food and supplies to take care of X number of people. To bring in 15 people all at once would be nearly impossible and would not be fair to those people that are in Woodbury, despite the fact that they would want to do it, because they would want to save these people. So the governor makes an executive decision that they need to be murdered because he can't just go back there and say, yep, sorry guys, it's a food thing. So he kills them, and that solves the problem. So he's making a decision, an executive decision, to keep his people safe against their own will, which tells you everything you need to know about the governor. Or he's tried to introduce military people before, and uh, or or is afraid of introducing military people because then all of a sudden it would be a, a threat to his power. Insecurity that tells you about that tells you something about the governor. The only thing that doesn't tell you about the governor is if he just likes killing people. And also it's stupid because murderers don't make good leaders. Like they're more concerned about murdering. They're not really concerned about like, hey, did the trash get picked up today? Uh, and then, meanwhile, we have this Andrea thing, where it's like, all right, the Andrea Michonne argument of whether or not they should leave Woodbury is 
the uh, should we find fucking whatever lost little girl was last season. Just, I don't care. Just do one. Just go. Go do that. And then, and then, you know, like, does the governor want to fuck Andrea? Was the, was the governor really upset that Andrea didn't like the, 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 the stage zombie fights? I don't know. I don't know. And he's, the, he, he's just like, it doesn't connect. He just doesn't seem like enough of a personality to be running this town. And that's what I wanted. Now, that might not be the story they want to tell, and I get that. That's their story. But... And then there's the Merle thing. Just gonna say. Set the Rooker free. Set him free. One time for he's off the show, you've squandered it, you fucking robots. Um, he's not done anything. He's had these very, very boring, dry conversations for what should be a, a very interesting character. Someone who's left for dead in the middle of a zombie wasteland is picked up by these people, hooked on drugs, very, very angry. Guy who does not take kindly to uh, leadership. When we last met him, now all of a sudden is the consummate uh, second in command. Motherfuckers, Commander Riker now. Messed up, coked up fucking psychopath, racist psychopath, is now all of a sudden number two. Ken from Chicago, the governor saved Merle's life. Yes. Yes. I would like to know more about that. I would like to know more about how Rooker thinks his life is different. There was this moment with him and Andrea had this conversation. Beautiful moment. Just where I was waiting. Waiting for the Rooker monologue. Because the Rooker monologue, it's a thing of beauty. It's a thing he's done his whole goddamn career. He's fucking fantastic at it. He can just fucking drill into your brain with a nice little Rooker monologue. And Andrea's like, well, what do you think about the governor? He's like, let me tell you something. I had, I was in a bad spot. And then I'm like, Oh, here we go. Here we go. Here's a fucking Brooker monologue to beat the band. And then he just came back and was like, it's a good man. Leave it at that. See, Curly, let's talk about who's in charge here. I vote me. That's great. That was part of a great, uh, you know, force of personality kind of Brooker moment. And we just don't get that now. We don't see it. He's not intimidating. We don't see that he's all that... I mean, he's just... The only thing, he's going from interesting to boring. That's the biggest difference in the character. You know... I just... I don't know... I don't know where this show is going. I've liked, by and large, everything that's happened in the in the prison. Which is shocking, because I was really hoping that the Woodbury stuff would carry this season. And and so far, that's been very, very disappointing. The prison stuff has been uh, over my expectations. But that leaves me why I haven't written about it in two weeks, even though I really liked the episode before it. And that's just because I don't want to crap on, this, on the series. Like, I just don't want to piss people off. I don't want to be a troll for this series. Um... Ken from Chicago says, Justin, do you want Merle to be more over the top like in season one? Well, I mean, he was an over the top guy in season one. So I want him to be true to who the character is. And I just, if this is him being true to the character, I just find the character to be more boring now. Like, I just, I don't feel like there's, there's somebody who has been on a road to recovery. And if he has been on a road to recovery, when he sees people who last saw him when he was not in that in that position, I would just like to see kind of more from it. I would just like to see that fleshed out a little bit more. Uh, and, and I don't need to see him be a wild psychopath, because if he's not that, then you shouldn't force him to be that. By the way, he's very interesting when he is that. But, like, let's just... 
I don't know. Get something. Get get a little connective tissue in there. And a monologue. Or else penalties will be created and enforced. Yes. Uh, Ken from Chicago says, Justin, but Merlin sees one was too over the top. Hard to see how we could fit into any group. I agree. We agree. We agree. If if the thing we might disagree on is that you think that what we've gotten so far has been satisfying to you in terms of how this character got from point A to point B, or you do not find it interesting that he got from point A to point B. That we might disagree on that because I would find that very very interesting. I would like to know more about that. I would like to know more about that from the people that have interacted with Rooker. Uh, you know, that have seen his transformation, that are in Woodbury, the other members of the governor's inner circle. I would like to see it from Rooker himself. I would like to see it from the governor. I'd like to see how he treats him or how he did treat him or, or you know, it doesn't have to be a flashback. Just give us something. Fuck, Jesus. Uh, M. Kopelke says... Having said that, it could totally be the stuff in Woodbury never gets interesting, which would totally suck. Allow me to introduce you to the hunt for Sophia. I mean, yeah, it had an interesting end, but was that end worth fucking eight episodes of horse shittery? No. No. Let me fucking introduce you to my new character, the pessimistic cow. No. So that's why I haven't been writing about it. I'll write about it this week, but it's just... Oh, oh, I don't want to... I don't want to pick a fight on this. I like picking fights about a lot of things. I don't want to pick a fight on this. I just don't. Um, all right. Well, you want to know what? Uh, let's go ahead and, and take uh, some questions here from the chat room, and then we'll wrap it up. Uh... Real quick, Walking Dead stuff, MK Opelke says, do you think season three is still better than season two, or is it sliding? It is sliding, but it's still better than season two. It's still very, very better than season two. Because season two, at this point, fucking had me wanting to stab somebody in the eye. Uh, oh, let's talk about some trailers real quick. I'll do a little trailer part. Uh, World War Z trailer came out. And uh, I think it's good. looks good. Um, you know, we don't quite exactly know what, what the story is. We know the plot is, you know, a uh, mass zombie thing. I think it, it, it's a real big adaptation because from what I know about the book, it's very much, you know, uh, just various. It's like an, an oral history, really, of uh, people who are dealing with the zombie apocalypse. And it's it's very all over the place. So this is really just taking that universe and either telling, expanding on one of the stories or telling an original story inside the universe. And uh, I don't know. I mean, I haven't read the book. I'll probably read the book before the movie comes out. But it's also had, uh, it's been very troubled, apparently. They had to do a bunch of really late reshoots, which is not always the best sign that a movie is going to be amazing. Um, I do like the large-scale zombie dynamic thing, though. That I find cool. Like the whole zombies walking on zombies walking on zombies to get over a wall because they're just absolute psychopaths like i like that that's a cool idea and i'm glad that you know in this era of cg um that you can do that and look we already if only in the trailer we already have the but in the book there's slow zombies in the book there's fast zombies in the movie that's fine. Um, okay, another trailer came out. Uh, now You See It, which I've been covering a lot for eye tricks uh, when it was filming. It stars Mark Ruffalo, the Facebook kid, Borat's wife, Woody Harrelson, and Morgan Freeman. And uh, somebody's brother. Whose brother? James Franco's brother. Uh, looks cool. Looks good. I mean, obviously, it's a magic movie. I'll be covering it a lot because I write eye tricks, which is a magic blog. But, um, you know, a movie like that is all crime movies are all dependent on, you know, uh, how much you like the characters, the motivations of the characters and how cool the, uh, the the set pieces and the plan is. 
you know, so far we have uh, promises for a very interesting plan with a big twist ending, which every movie that is about magicians has to be like a magic trick in and of itself, which is, I mean, I don't know. Okay, I guess. Uh, we don't really know a whole lot about the plot because we don't really know a whole lot about the characters, except for the fact that they're magicians. But we'll see. We will see. Um, so somebody, uh, Jason Simmons asked, uh, have I started Assassin's Creed 3 yet? If so, am I enjoying it? We were told that we were getting a copy sent to us by Ubisoft because we ran the Go game for them. Um, I don't know if we've gotten it yet. I haven't I, to be honest, if we had it, I wouldn't really have had a chance to play it. Um, I, you know, I've been, I've been busy, but now I'm, I'm into a, a, a point where I'm not going to be as busy. Um, oh man, Leon1337 says, you guys going to have the TMS guys on NSFW for Thanksgiving again. To be honest, uh, honest uh, I, I haven't, uh, we haven't talked about it. I do know that we will have a guest uh, on our Tuesday episode, and that is uh, one Ali Spagnola. Brian doesn't even know this. But I have concocted a plan with Ali Spagnola, and there is an awesome, uh, there's an awesome surprise for you guys. It's going to be pretty fucking awesome. So that's not on Thanksgiving. That's on Tuesday, NSFW this Tuesday. Um, I don't think we're going to do another Power Hour. We'll see. We'll see. Um... And then, um, yeah, I guess it looks like we're going to be on Twit. Uh, me, Brian, and I think uh, Padre SJ, who's going to be hosting it, is endeavoring to get Shiera Lazar and Patrick Norton. I don't know if they're going to be available on such short notice, but I will be, and Brian is. And, um, yeah, so we're going to do that. We're going to be on Twit, looks like. So that'll be tomorrow at... Uh, 3 p.m. Tamara on on Twit. Of course, weird things on Monday. NSFW on Tuesday, and then uh, we are fucking dick deep in holidays after that. It's gonna be a real big fucking deal. Um. All right. MK Opelki, do you guys do the Weird Things recording live? Yeah, on weirdthings.com. Every single Monday. Oh, fuck. Also, I'm on Gizwiz next week. A lot of me. If you like me, there's going to be much, much more of me. Which makes me think that I should stop doing this because you guys are going to be fucking sick of me by the time that Tuesday is over. So I will wrap this fat bitch up. Um, do me a favor. Uh, I... Uh, I'm going to do the, a podcast version of this. I think I'm going to spend the rest of today figuring out a podcast version of this. And uh, we will go from there. But until next time, this is your old pal, Justin Robert Young, imploring you that until the next time you hear my voice, please don't die. Don't die.